Okay, okay. Time to resolve this cliffhanger. Because I bet it's been absolutely killing you guys. Alright, so the last time we talked, we saw that if we were to free radical chlorinate isobutane, we get isobutyl chloride. However, if we were to free radical brominate isobutane, we get t-butyl bromide. So now we're going to actually dig into why do we see this discrepancy. So first, let me tell you a thing or two about the heats of reactions of these two. Chlorination, free radical chlorination is extremely exothermic, extremely fast. Roughly, depending on what reactor you use, it's somewhere around negative 30 kilojoules per mole. Not that I have a great feel for heats of reactions, but I do know that this is very, 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 very exothermic. On the other hand, bromine, free radical bromination, it's somewhere around or less than around negative 10 kilojoules per mole. So you can see that there is a clear exothermic difference between these two, right? Chlorination, bam, very good, very favorable, happens very quickly. Bromine, yes, still exothermic, but obviously there's a big gap between the two. So now we're going to explain, due to this thermodynamic result, oops, this helps us explain the difference between where the halogen ends up. And the term here is regiochemistry. The regiochemistry is different. All that means is where things end up. So this chlorine ends up on the primary position, but that over here, there's a different regiochemical outcome. So there's... You know, the bromine ends up on the tertiary carbon here. So if you want to add a big word to your repertoire, regiochemical or regiochemistry just means where things go on a molecule. Okay, so before we kind of dig into exactly why this happens, I need to rehash something about hybridization and bonding that I think I may have forgot to tell you guys. Okay, so really quickly, let's go over this. Hopefully this is something quick we can all understand. So if I was to draw... The, the, the bond line, or the, the structure of ethene, it would look like this, right? And if we we're going to assign hybridization, we can see one, two, three bonding areas. We need an S, a P, and a P. This carbon, as well as this carbon, they are both sp2 hybridized, right? Okay, so you notice that remember when we were assigning hybridization, we have all of these orbitals at our disposal, right? an S and three P's. So if something's sp2 hybridized, you know, right, we use this orbital, this orbital, this orbital, we are left over with an unhybridized P orbital. And I'm pretty sure I included this on one of the worksheets, but I didn't get to actually say it out loud, so I apologize for this. But if we're going to kind of zoom in on the bonds these two carbons make, let me just draw C, C, and H, 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 H. So we see that there's this head-to-head -head bond, this direct bond right here. And if I kind of want to draw orbitals, right, it looks like this. It's a head-to-head -head bond. That is called a sigma bond. And that's the lowercase Greek letter for sigma. So there's one of the bonds in a double bond. You always have a sigma bond no matter what. This is a sigma bond. This is a sigma bond. When you hear sigma bond, think single bond, head-to-head -head orbital overlap. However, we know in a double bond there's obviously two bonds. So where's the other one? Well, it comes like this. It comes in the shape of two orbitals that look like this. This is the unhybridized p orbital of this carbon and the unhybridized p orbital of this carbon. And this right here, this bond is called a pi bond, right? Just like the you know, 3.14 whatever. So what a pi bond, some characteristics of a pi bond are that you need to have two p orbitals that are parallel to each other. That's imperative. And there's this partial overlap between them where, you know, there's one electron in both, just a single-headed arrow for an electron. This is what a pi bond is. There's, there has to be a set of parallel p orbitals, and they slightly interact with each other. And there's no free rotation about that bond, because otherwise the orbitals wouldn't be parallel to each other. Okay, just wanted to get that out of the way. So because this is going to help us explain, believe it or not, that difference in regiochemistry from bromination to chlorination. So let me redraw this over here. Okay. So here's why we see a difference. So remember, we just discussed 
how, whoops, that's a bromine. We just discussed how chlorination is extremely exothermic. Bromine, a little less exothermic. So if you can see how we're attaching the chlorine at this primary carbon and the bromine at this tertiary carbon, the radical intermediates must have looked like this, right? For chlorine, it must have looked like this because we eventually added a radical chlorine on this carbon. On the other hand, for bromination, it must have looked like this, right? So if you can follow me on that, actually let me draw this a little lower. If we have, must have produced these radicals, this is the type of bond we must have broken, right? We should have had something like this in our reaction mechanisms to where we had a CH bond here and this broke and this hydrogen left snatched up by a radical uh, chlorine. On the other hand, this hydrogen left, right? This type of thing happened. This CH bond broke, right? Producing the radicals we see over here. So what I'm going to tell you is that this bond is easier to break. The tertiary CH bond is easier to break than this primary CH bond. In, another, in other words, I'm going to tell you that this radical is more stable than this one. And here's why. Let me erase this over here. There's a concept called hyperconjugation. Big word, not, not as scary as it sounds. Hyperconjugation. And here's what hyperconjugation means. Let's pick, let's look at these two radicals, right? I'm going to kind of draw them on like a side view. So if we look at this carbon's hybridization, he's actually sp2 hybridized. This radical, this lone radical, resides in an unhybridized p orbital. However, right, this isn't like a pi bond situation, right? We don't have any one else that has an unhybridized p orbital. However, what you can look at, let me draw both real quick, what you can look at and what is a stabilizing force is that you can look at all of the CH bonds next door to that radical. They're constantly spinning. We talked about that in, with Newman projections, right? Single bonds have no restrictions on their axis of rotation, so they're constantly, constantly spinning. At some point, one of these orbitals of these CH bonds, like right here, they're going to align with each other, right? This bond for a fleeting, fleeting second, because these rotations are quick, it's going to align parallel with the unhybridized p orbital that this radical is in. So, that's a stabilizing effect, if only for a second. And see, the more of these kind of interactions you have, the more stable your radical is, right? So you can see that this radical right here, he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, kind of like CH neighbors. These orbitals, he has nine opportunities at any given moment to have someone be parallel to him and help him stabilize his radical. However, so that's why he is very stable. On the other hand, if you look at this primary situation, the only neighbor he has is this one CH bond. So you can see that, you know, he doesn't have that many opportunities for someone to align parallel with him. He's a little less stable. That's what hyperconjugation is. The aligning, the fleeting interaction of some other neighboring orbital aligning with a radical's unhybrid sp orbital that helps it kind of mimic a pi bond, right? So hyperconjugation is that stabilizing effect of that fleeting alignment. So the quick way I kind of remember it, and shout out my, uh, shout out my honors OCHEM teacher, Mr. Long, for this one. But if we're going to look at these two radical structures right here, so if we're going to look at this tertiary radical, just think about if your puppy died, and you just need to see how many friends you have in your support network to help you through these tough times. So if you're this tertiary radical, we need to see how many CH bonds you're next to, aka how many friends you have to help you help console you over the death of your cute little puppy. Right? So if you're this tertiary radical, you're sitting pretty good because you got nine friends. Obviously it sucks, and you're gonna miss your little pupper, but nine friends, that's pretty good. You're gonna you're gonna make it through. On the other hand, if you're this primary radical, if your doggo passes away, you only have one friend to help you through. So Unfortunately, 
you're less stable. But on the other hand, this guy, pretty stable. So think about this in terms of energy diagrams. And let's forget about puppies because they're adorable. If we're going to think about this on an energy diagram, right? If I'm going to rank this guy's stability over him, right? Remember, less stable means higher energy. So let's put him up here. On the other hand, this, oh, sorry, wrong radical, wrong radical, this guy. On the other hand, this guy, more stable, means less energy. So let's stick him down here. And remember, we came from the same precursor, the same original structure. So let's just put his energy level down here just for, just for fun. So remember, right, it takes, if you, you can see this pictorially, it takes less energy to go from here to, let's say, up to here. And here's the take-home point. Hopefully you, I explained that well and you're following. So remember, chlorination, extremely exothermic. Making this work, spend, expending this extra energy to make this radical work, that's totally okay. It's so exothermic, it doesn't really matter. However, bromination, it's almost like you're like a, a little more of a penny pincher, right? You're watching your finances. You got to make sure you're going to take the most efficient, low cost in terms of energy path to produce your radical. Bromination, you're always going to look to break the easiest CH bond to make the most stable radical because your reaction isn't as exothermic as, say, chlorination. For chlorination, you're just going to break whatever CH bond is most prevalent, right? And think about it. Over here, there's three CH bonds here, three CH bonds here, three CH bonds here. That's the most prevalent, most abundant CH bond. So hopefully that made sense. I'm going to erase a bunch of this, and I'm going to try and summarize it clearly. Okay, I'm going to try and rehash everything we just talked about in this video. So remember, chlorination, bromination, both free radical mechanisms. Remember we established that chlorination is very exothermic and happens very quickly. Bromination, on the other hand, it's less exothermic. It's not as rapid as chlorination. And as a result of, the, of, of what, that, of what we just discussed, remember, chlorination, it looks to break the most prevalent, the most abundant CH bond, right? Doesn't matter if it's going to produce the most stable radical, it's just going to look where there are the most CH bonds. However, bromination on the other hand, remember, not as exothermic, it's trying to break the easiest bond so the reaction can remain as favorable as possible. So remember, the easiest CH bond to break translates to the most stable radical. And remember, the way we evaluate radical stability is hyperconjugation. So remember, the more neighbors you have, the more chances you have to mimic that pi bond and get parallel with an orbital that's rotating for a radical that's in an unhybridized p orbital. So basically, if I'm going to summarize this, you can think of it like this. If you're a tertiary radical, you're the most stable radical you can be. That is more stable than a secondary radical, which is more stable than a primary radical, or, you know, if you're just methane, greater than a methyl radical. Okay. All right, guys, now that we're done with the free radical chain reaction, alkanes, we're going to say goodbye, and the next thing we're going to tackle, stereochemistry. Let's do it.